In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you this morning from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, have you ever heard the phrase, the self-made man? It was originally coined in 1832, a phrase used once in the U.S. Senate to describe certain people who seem to be more responsible for their own achievements, their successes, than their outer circumstances. Benjamin Franklin is known to be one of the greatest examples of the self-made man rising as the son of a candle maker to someone who held such great influence over our entire country. His essays and autobiography, The Poor Richard's Almanac, are widely known. His inventions, like the lightning rod, the Franklin stove, and bifocal glasses, were great leaps of progress in his day. And all of these things, Franklin achieved without the advantage of coming from wealth. He was number 15 of 17 children in his family. Not too bad for a guy whose father made candles. I don't know it comes from good intentions, but that phrase, the self-made man, it's kind of a misnomer. The title, it doesn't really match the reality. It's amazing to hear stories that's about people like Ben Franklin who rose up from virtually nothing and achieved great things in their lifetime. These kinds of people are inspiring to us. But the truth is, they didn't get there on their own. In fact, none of us has gotten to where we are on our own. We wouldn't be where we are today if it weren't for parents and teachers leaders and mentors in our lives, shaping and equipping us. And ultimately, none of this would be possible if not for a God who created us to bear his image and his son who redeemed us to be the vessels of his light in a world so accustomed with darkness. In our text from Hebrews 13, we're challenged to think about the purpose and the impact of our lives. The stuff that makes us up, who we are, and what we're about. And at first, we're given quite a list of imperatives. Things we're called to demonstrate if we want to live a remarkable life. A sacrificial life that pleases God. Let brotherly love continue. Show hospitality to strangers. Remember those who are in prison, the mistreated, and the oppressed. Honor God in your relationships, especially in your commitment to your spouse. Keep free from the love of money and be content. And then toward the end of our text, we're encouraged to look to those who have gone before us. Those who have influenced us in great ways and helped us to see and know God and his word. Remember your leaders. Those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and to today and forever. It's a sad and scary thought 
to think about where you might be today. If you didn't have a certain community of caring and supporting people in your life, if you didn't have certain men and women in your life who have reflected God's heart to you and guided you to better understand the remarkable life that we should share and possess in Christ. The sad and scary truth is that there are people who do seek to live this way. And maybe we've even had times and phases in our own lives where we'd rather not be connected as deeply to a larger community of God's people around us. Some of this stems from the idea of being spiritual, but not religious. It's the idea that someone, they can still love Jesus, they can hold his teaching in high regard, they can live out their faith as an individual, but that's where it stays. It's individualistic. And there's a great and growing skepticism of any organized religion in our own community of faith. And the hard truth is, is for some people, it's a reaction to a negative experience that they've had of somehow being led to feel or believe that they can't or they don't belong to, to the church, which is the furthest thing from the God honest truth. Our epistle from Hebrews, it reminds us all once again that we need God and we need each other. There is no such thing as a lone wolf Christian. We were made for community. We were made to rely on our Heavenly Father and the support and the care that we give to one another. To be able to say confidently with each other, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The writer of Hebrews says it this way, just a chapter earlier here in chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We need this, don't we? We need to be surrounded by each other. Surrounded by the church here on earth and those saints and those leaders that have gone before us and will come after us. We need to know that we're not in this alone. We need people to help us understand what it means to, to fix our eyes on Christ. The only hope we have, and the only strength that we have, and our true source of life to live this life that honors Him. For those of you that grew up in the Lutheran Church, do you remember that, that moment that you stood before your congregation to be confirmed? And for others, I'm sure that there was a moment in your life where you affirmed your own faith in a very meaningful way. Do you remember that? standing before your church and pastors in all your adolescent glory. And maybe you were excited. Maybe you were super nervous, and maybe it was a mixture of both, and they peppered you with all the questions you knew would be coming, but it was still a big deal because you were front and center, and you answered them. And then came one of the most potent questions of all, in my mind. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession and church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it. I can still see some of the faces of my former confirmation students in Illinois when they answered that question. Some of them answered with wide eyes, feeling some of that great expectation. Some were so nervous they just wanted to say anything they could to just get back to the pew, and some, their eyes were simply glazed over. But each one answered to that question the same. I do, by the grace of God. And sitting out in those church PQs with family and friends and fellow church members who might have known as well as I, they probably don't fully grasp the gravity of all that. But by the grace of God, there they were. There we once were affirming our faith. And there in the assembly were men and women who could see 
just a little bit further down that horizon. Great mentors and encouragers who shared in God's word with those young students, models of life and faith, not perfect people by any means, but even in their weaknesses, people worth imitating as they sought to imitate Christ. If you thought about it, I bet you could picture who some of those people are for you. The faithful men and women who have helped you to see Jesus so much more clearly. And what a blessing we have right here at Concordia that we get to live in just this. We get to have faithful staff and faculty members that help us see Jesus, that offer their own lives and their own experiences as models of faith and life for all of us. And let me tell you, from my experience, you don't know how blessed you are until you end up leaving this place. They join the ranks of this great cloud of witnesses that has enveloped you, helped shape you to be the person that you are today. Let's thank God for them. Remember them. Learn from them. God knows that they don't get it all right. There are no self-made men and women. But even better than that, they're God-made and Christ-redeemed. And they're the kinds of people that do the best thing that anyone could ever do for us. And the challenges and difficulties and inconsistencies of this life, they point us to the most consistent thing we have going for us. That Jesus Christ, our Jesus, is the same yesterday and today and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.